When considering the history of World War II, 1943 is of vital importance. Many strategies being implemented by the Allies were starting to come to fruition, as gradually Adolf Hitler and the Axis powers' stranglehold in both the European and Pacific theatres of war were slowly but surely being loosened. The Germans and the Italians faced humiliating defeat on the northern shores of Africa as the Allied armies, under America's General Eisenhower, forced them to abandon the continent altogether. The battle for North Africa had already helped draw some of Hitler's military resources away from the Eastern Front, where his forces had taken on Russia's Red Army, as all the while the Allies would keep the pressure up on Germany itself with heavy bombings of the nation's major industrial cities. At sea, the British in the Atlantic and the Americans in the Pacific would begin to gain the upper hand over enemy submarines, as Allied planes and submarines coming off the production line were equipped with the latest technology and increasing use was made of patrol planes and light aircraft carriers. The liberation of Europe would never be able to go ahead until the Battle of the Atlantic had been won. For some, an Allied victory could not come soon enough. The horrific Nazi genocide of Europe's Jews was proceeding with murderous efficiency. As details of the atrocities filtered out to London and Washington, British Prime Minister Winston Churchill and America's President Roosevelt judged that the only response could be a continued grim determination to defeat Nazi Germany and its brutal ideology. Already focused on the next step, their resolve was further strengthened as an Allied advance into Italy, using the island of Sicily as a starting point, had more poignant purpose than ever. To set the scene, back in late 1942, British and American forces had made successful landings in North Africa. The Allies had also won over to their side many French commanders there who had previously been loyal to the French Vichy government that was collaborating with the Nazis. But in the spring of 1943, Germany and Italy had continued to send reinforcements from Europe across the Mediterranean and the relatively inexperienced Allied troops moving from Algeria into Tunisia had met stiff resistance. They were having to learn fast in the most difficult of conditions, but progress was being made. To the south, the 8th Army, led by British General Montgomery, had driven the Germans back from Libya and into Tunisia 
as Erwin Rommel, who was suffering from the strain of months of combat, had been recalled by the Fuhrer and replaced. In the South Pacific, the Americans and Australians had begun what they hoped would be a series of victories against the Japanese in the Solomon chain of islands north of Australia. With some difficulty and at a cost of many lives, they had taken the first island, Guadalcanal. And with this achieved, understandably, they wanted to give the Japanese no respite. Japan, Hitler's strongest ally, was in control of a wide circumference, including parts of China, much of Southeast Asia, New Guinea, Papua, and in the North Pacific, the tiny Aleutian Islands. It was essential to keep the Japanese on the defensive to prevent them from fortifying the Pacific Islands they held, building up their air bases and making the Axis position a great deal more secure. As we know, back in Africa, there were equally important matters being discussed. Meeting in the Moroccan city of Casablanca in January 1943, Churchill and Roosevelt, with the advice of their commanders, agreed on invading Sicily as soon as practicable, leaving a cross-channel invasion of France for the following year. This was despite the misgivings of some American generals who did not want the war in the Mediterranean to use up much time or military resources. The hope was that Italy could be taken out of the war and the Allies would be able to buy more time to build up their military strength before any invasion of northern France. The British knew they were fighting a powerful military-industrial machine that was yet undamaged in its heartland. Hitler and the Axis powers would have to be worn down by a second front in Italy first, before a direct invasion of France could realistically be considered. So, by the time April 1st, 1943 dawned, events in North Africa and plans for the invasion of Sicily became of paramount importance for both sides in the conflict. Germany's military commander in the Mediterranean and North Africa, General Albert Kesselring, could congratulate his forces on having slowed the Allied advance across Tunisia from the west. But time was not really on the side of the Germans and Italians. The Axis forces were slowly but steadily being pushed back in southern Tunisia towards the capital, Tunis. Their use of panzer tanks had been impressive, with the model having been upgraded after coming up against heavy Soviet tanks on the Eastern Front. Nevertheless, the British and Americans quickly strengthened their position, with increased numbers of tanks and aircraft in North Africa. And with the airfield they now controlled, were able to give their ground forces much better air support. In the first week of April, the Allies bombed not only the Italian mainland, but also hit Axis transport planes in the air and ships bringing supplies by sea. Moving cautiously up the coast, army sappers worked on detecting mines and filling in craters in the road. The troops were glad to be passing through fertile agricultural land and olive groves after months crossing the rocky tracks of the Libyan desert. But more importantly, the Tunisian roads provided them with a much smoother driving surface. Pitting his wits against Kesselring, America's General Dwight D. Eisenhower was in overall command of the Allied forces in the Mediterranean, with Britain's Field Marshal Harold Alexander as his second in command. Alexander strategically reorganized the Allied front, placing the American forces that were moving in from the west opposite the town of Bizert on the northern coast road into Tunis. 
Also, the British First Army that had arrived in North Africa with the Americans some months earlier were ordered to head for the Tunisian capital. One of the last major confrontations for Montgomery's weary men was the Battle of Wadi Akarit, about 17 miles north of Gabes. The fighting was bitterly hard fought, but the British infantry, supported by plenty of artillery, were able to instigate an all-out attack across the plain. On the evening of April 7th, the Americans, along with the British First Army forces, at last linked up with the 8th Army soldiers, many of whom had never even met an American before. The more recent Allied arrivals found the battle-hardened soldiers of the 8th Army scruffy and poorly disciplined, but with an impressively united fighting spirit. However, all the battle units now brought together in the final push to complete Allied operations in North Africa had by now lost thousands of men, either killed or wounded in the desert sands. Progress continued to be made as the Allies took the Tunisian town of Sfax, which was quickly followed by Sousse along the coast. Then, with the worst of the fighting for North Africa behind them, the 8th Army, having come so far after battling so hard, found themselves playing a secondary role, pinning down as many troops as possible away from Tunis and Bizert. The writing was now on the wall for the Germans and the Italians in North Africa, and for the Italians, the cracks in this unequal alliance were beginning to show, as the threat of an Allied invasion of their homeland gathered momentum. As more and more Italian soldiers were taken prisoner, it became clear that support for the Axis alliance was faltering among ordinary Italians. What's more, the people of Italy were unhappy with the treatment of Italian workers drafted into the German factories, and even their leader, Benito Mussolini, was questioning Hitler's intentions, as the supply of coal and oil that Germany had promised did not always materialize. When Hitler and Mussolini met near Salzburg in Austria, both appeared to be visibly strained. Those around Hitler were shocked to see how sick and despondent Mussolini looked as he urged peace talks with the Allies, but the German Führer would have none of it. Eventually, Hitler managed to browbeat and cajole the hapless Mussolini into continuing to fight to hold Tunis, convincing his now reluctant ally that this was essential if fascism was to survive in Italy. But Hitler's own situation was far from secure, and he too faced criticism from his own people, who were by now experiencing great hardship and feeling that the Third Reich was not as invincible as they had been promised. Propaganda became more important than ever, and for Hitler, events in Russia soon gave him an opportunity to justify his position. At a place named Katyn in the Soviet countryside near Smolensk, a Russian peasant made an astounding declaration to the occupying Germans, claiming that the bodies of thousands of lost Polish officers were buried close by in the forest. For Joseph Goebbels, Hitler's loyal minister of propaganda, it was the best news he'd had to work with for some time. After some exploration of the Russian peasant story, the Nazis discovered mass graves of more than 4,200 Polish officers, slaughtered by the Soviets back in 1939, when Stalin had been in league with Adolf Hitler rather than the Allies. The Russian position was delicate because since their defection to the Allied cause after the Nazi invasion of the Soviet Union, Hitler's Operation Barbarossa, the British and Americans still viewed Stalin with great suspicion. Goebbels was quick to condemn the Russians' brutality against the Polish officers, but conveniently omitted to mention the barbaric treatment of the Poles, particularly the Jews, by the Germans. 
matters were more difficult still because the toppled Polish government had fled into exile in London in 1939 and wanted the atrocity at Katyn exposed. It took a great deal of diplomatic manoeuvring to keep what had been an uneasy alliance at the best of times intact, but British and US officials managed to prevent what would have been a disastrous split in the Allied position. Nevertheless, the spotlight was destined to remain on Poland as April gave way to May 1943, with events in the capital Warsaw under German occupation hitting the headlines. Eastern Europe in 1943 held too many secrets and too much horror. As April began, a new gas chamber had been installed at the extermination camp at Auschwitz, one of six extermination camps operating on Polish territory. Consignments of prisoners, mainly Jews from various European countries and also non-Jewish Poles and Gypsies, were brought in cattle trucks. On arrival, most of the men, women and children were sent for immediate gassing, with only a minority allowed to live a while longer as slave labour. In the Polish capital, Warsaw, all Jews had been confined to the traditional Jewish quarter, under guard and shut off from the rest of the city by high walls. Around 400,000 Jews and some gypsies existed there on minimum rations as the Germans used slow starvation on a community that was also vulnerable to typhus and tuberculosis. Then the pace of deportations to the extermination camp at Treblinka was stepped up. By April 1943, only 60,000 people remained in the Warsaw Ghetto, mainly young adults. These people knew by now that they had nothing to lose and some had formed secret resistance groups using arms smuggled in from the Polish underground outside the ghetto. After a small-scale uprising by the Jewish resistance in January, Heinrich Himmler, head of the Nazi SS paramilitary, decided the time had come to raise the ghetto to the ground. He sent an SS force in on April 19th with tanks, flamethrowers and dynamite squads, and though the armed groups resisted desperately with what weapons they had, the Germans soon started burning them out and forcing them into sewers and underground bunkers. 13,000 Polish Jews were killed in the revolt, but the Warsaw Ghetto uprising had been a brave and desperate act of defiance, and it gave Hitler and his generals a taste of what was to come. Resistance against the Axis was growing stronger by the day, and as battles intensified across the globe, it was a time of intense planning and strategizing for the Allies. Keeping the seaways open to move troops into position all over the world was of vital importance. And while the British Navy was taking a lead role in the North Atlantic, in the South Pacific theatre of war, US pilots and marines were spearheading the Allied counterattack against Japan's drive for dominance. In New Guinea and the Solomon Islands, Japan was now fighting a defensive war under the direction of Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto. Yamamoto had unusually studied in the United States. He had even initially opposed the militarism that led Japan into war, but now he was a marked man for the Americans. It was he who had planned the Pearl Harbor attack of December 1941, and while the Japanese public still viewed him as a national hero, the Americans were keen to eliminate the man responsible for thousands of American deaths. 
In April 1943, the Americans decoded an intercepted radio message that revealed Admiral Yamamoto would make a flight in the Solomons on an inspection trip to his troops. The bomber carrying the VIP was to land on an island near Bougainville in the north. Seizing the opportunity on April 18th, four American fighter aircraft took off from Guadalcanal following orders from President Roosevelt and homed in on Yamamoto's flight path. The bomber carrying the Admiral was attacked and sent plummeting down into the jungle of Bougainville. Yamamoto's body was later recovered by a Japanese search party, but Tokyo did not announce his death until weeks later for fear it would affect morale. The Americans in turn could not boast their triumph immediately, as to do so would reveal that they had broken the secret communications code used by the Japanese Navy. But while the news of Yamamoto's death remained unannounced, a nationwide address heightened American animosity towards the Japanese. On April 21st, Roosevelt revealed that three members of an American aircrew had been executed in Japan. The three men, two pilots and a gunner, had been among 80 crewmen who had survived a raid led by Lieutenant Colonel Jimmy Doolittle one year earlier. Doolittle was an aviator who had already been something of a celebrity before the war. The Americans had hoped to shake the morale of the Japanese with the bombardment of military and industrial targets in cities around Japan. It had been the first Allied raid on Japanese home territory, a bold move that Tokyo had been eager to avenge. The news of the barbarous executions was met with horror by the Americans, and Roosevelt announced that those responsible would not go unpunished, a message that was also intended as a warning to the Japanese over their treatment of some 17,000 other Americans held as prisoners of war. By May 1943, the focus of the confrontation between the US and the Japanese shifted for a while to the northernmost edge of the Pacific Ocean. There, a chain of tiny volcanic islands, the Aleutians, extended out from the US state of Alaska towards Siberia and Japan. In 1942, Japanese forces had moved onto the two Aleutian islands nearest to Japan, Atu and Kiska. Thanks to their code breakers, the Americans had ignored this invasion as they knew it was merely a diversionary tactic and that in fact the Japanese intended to attack the strategically important island of Midway in the Central Atlantic. Nevertheless, while Tokyo made much of the invasion of the Aleutians in their propaganda, the Americans were soon looking for a way to oust them and to this end began to build an airfield on Adduk Island near Alaska. Towards the end of April, U.S. invasion forces had set sail from San Francisco bound for Atu Island, a barren landscape often so windy that barely a tree could grow. After two days, the U.S. warships were in position and started to bombard Japanese defenses by the beginning of May, as a dense fog took hold of the island, the infantry were sent in on landing craft, hoping to take the Japanese garrison by surprise. In bitter fighting that would last through May, the U.S. soldiers managed first to reach the valley leading to Chichagov Harbor, but the Japanese would not surrender. 
the last of them broke out of their final positions, charging towards the American lines in a suicide wave, but their last stand would be futile. By the time the conflict had drawn to a close, there were over 2,000 Japanese dead. The Americans themselves lost more than 500 of their men, and over 2,000 had been evacuated, suffering badly from frostbite or disease. Atu, back in American hands, now lay between the Japanese mainland and the island of Kiska, and by the time Allied soldiers set foot on Atu in August 1943, the 5,000-man garrison had already evacuated, leaving the inhospitable climate of the Aleutians to the Americans. In North Africa, meanwhile, the German and Italian forces in and around Tunis looked in danger of having no route for a retreat, despite Rommel's earlier plea to Hitler and Mussolini to pull their men out of North Africa and prepare for an Allied invasion of Europe. The Germans continued to bring troops and supplies into Tunis almost until the last minute. In May, as Bizert fell to American units, Further south, General Alexander unleashed a new offensive with an intensive artillery barrage of Tunis. Soon the first British armoured cars were able to sweep into the capital and before long, thousands of people were lining the streets to celebrate, throwing spring flowers at the troops. Beyond the capital, the enemy, those surrounded, continued to fight, rejecting invitations to surrender and to save useless bloodshed. Kesselring had already abandoned the African continent when finally, at the end of the second week in May, the Germans accepted their fate and made a formal surrender. The Italians soon followed suit, and while Axis soldiers flooded into prisoner-of-war enclosures, those captured amounted to around 125,000 Germans and 115,000 Italians. It was the largest haul of prisoners of war in the conflict to date, and certainly presented a logistical challenge as far as feeding and managing them was concerned. Nevertheless, Eisenhower remained unperturbed by this minor complication and was jubilant as he announced to the world that the Axis were now in retreat. Adolf Hitler once had a great army which he called the Africa Corps. It was commanded by General Erwin Rommel, who came to be known as the Desert Fox. Today, the brood of the fox has been utterly destroyed. Every member of that army, as well as every member of von Arman's army that Hitler sent into Africa to support Rommel, is either dead or has been captured. Three hours after the surrender, Winston Churchill, in meetings with Roosevelt in Washington, received a message from General Alexander informing him, The Tunisian campaign is over. All enemy resistance has ceased. We are masters of the North African shores. After three years of fighting up and down the desert plains and over mountains, the Allies had finally achieved their reward and could celebrate the end of the Axis Empire in Africa. Back in Washington, President Roosevelt and Winston Churchill were ready for discussions with senior British and American military decision makers during the conference codenamed Trident. On May 19th, Churchill addressed a joint session of both Houses of Congress, just as he had done in December 1941 in the aftermath of the Japanese bombing of Pearl Harbor. 
He was greeted by prolonged cheering even before he began his speech. But with the axis still at large, Churchill was eager to get down to business. All war plans, he said, must be dominated by the supreme objective of getting to grips with the enemy. The defeat of Germany must come first, and this would inevitably bring with it the defeat of Japan. But there were disagreements between Allied commanders over the best course of action to take next. Churchill argued for an invasion of mainland Italy, which he believed would serve to draw German troops away from the Russian front, where Stalin's forces were still battling for survival. The Americans, on the other hand, wanted a full-scale invasion of France launched as soon as possible and believed that no operations should be undertaken which might delay this effort. After long deliberation, an agreement was eventually made between the Allies to invade France in early 1944 with the date tentatively set for May. Churchill would also get his way and a lower priority Italian campaign was planned with immediate effect to take Italy out of the war. Meanwhile, the focus was on the Atlantic as vicious convoy battles were being fought. Before an invasion of France could take place, the Allies knew the Battle of the Atlantic had to be won and with heavy losses through early spring seriously affecting supplies arriving in the British Isles, there were fears that the Nazis were winning the war at sea. Fortunately, by May, it seemed the tables had turned, and slowly but surely, the Allies were gaining the upper hand. By the end of the month, a quarter of the total operational strength in the German Navy's submarine wing had been sunk. The son of Admiral Donitz, commander-in-chief of the Navy, had drowned with the rest of his crew on May 19th, and days later, the Nazi commander realized the time had come to withdraw to the South Atlantic. With only a few U-boats left roaming the North as a token threat, it seemed the two-year Axis battle to break British supply lines had been lost. Meanwhile, the factories continued to step up munitions production, and the war effort was beginning to tell, not only at sea, but in the skies over Germany. Throughout the spring of 1943, waves of British bombers launched attacks on major German cities under the command of Air Chief Marshal Sir Arthur Harris. Haunted by the memory of years of trench warfare in the First World War, the British saw aerial bombardment as a way to bypass fronts on the ground and shorten the war. The heavy bombing was not only targeted at destroying key industries, however, it was seen as a valuable weapon in undermining civilian morale in the fatherland. During the war, hundreds of thousands of Germans were left homeless by the attacks. And while conditions deteriorated in the cities, support for Adolf Hitler inevitably began to wane. In May 1943, the RAF were finalizing the details of a particularly daring raid on the country, which would focus on the Ruhr Valley in Germany. The aim was to rupture three dams in the area, which was home to much of Germany's heavy industry, including steelworks, chemical plants and coal mines. Working in the strictest secrecy, a British aircraft designer named Barnes Wallace had developed a drum-shaped bomb that it was hoped would bounce along the surface of the water towards a dam avoiding the torpedo nets that protected it. The bomb would then roll down the dam below the surface of the water before exploding. On May 16th, the raid Operation Chastise successfully destroyed the first and second dam, though the third would remain intact, 
Many thousands of gallons of water gushed out from the breaches in the two dams, flooding mines and cutting rail, road and canal links, as well as disrupting water supplies. Sadly, only nine out of 19 RAF planes returned from the mission, and 53 of the aircrew involved were killed in action. But despite the loss, the event was an important boost to British morale, as British cities continued to suffer from raids by the Luftwaffe. Meanwhile, for the population of occupied Europe, the sight of Allied bombers heading for Germany gave them some hope that the Nazis' so-called new order could not last forever. As planning continued for the cross-channel invasion of France, the hopes of those living under Nazi occupation were not unfounded. It was beginning to look increasingly likely that a cross-channel invasion of France would be possible in 1944, and with the ambitious task that now lay ahead, Roosevelt was keen to improve contacts with the grassroots French resistance. French people had been deeply divided by the coming of the Second World War. Not only were there the divisions between those who supported General Charles de Gaulle based in London and those who supported the collaborationist government of Marshal Patan based in the French town of Vichy, there were also many active in the resistance, including the French communists who supported neither Patan or de Gaulle. At the Casablanca conference in January, there had been a rather tense and awkward meeting between de Gaulle and his rival General Henri Giraud, who continued to maintain the Vichy regime in North Africa. Nevertheless, in joint leadership of the Free French forces, they called on all loyal men and women to rally to their cause. Eventually, the National Council of Resistance was set up as an umbrella for the diverse resistance groups who had been carrying out acts of sabotage against the Nazis, and people in occupied France began to do all they could to aid the Allies. In the meantime, the American secret services began to build their own direct links with the French resistance through contacts made in Switzerland, hoping that by channeling money into resistance action, they could get access to valuable military and strategic information about the Germans in France. But fighting for freedom did not come without its risks, and soon after the first meeting of the new National Council of Resistance, numerous leaders were arrested. During the course of the war, many men and women who fought back against the occupying forces in France would be incarcerated, tortured or killed by the dreaded Gestapo, but unhindered by the dangers, the fight for freedom went on. In Europe, the systematic genocide continued apace. By the summer of 1943, more than half the Jewish population of Europe had already been killed. Quietly proud of their extermination program, the Nazis did not trumpet the details in their propaganda and referred to killing by euphemisms such as special action and special measures. At Auschwitz in Poland, on average 33,000 people a month were being gassed at the concentration camp and after the elimination of the Warsaw Ghetto in May, on June 11th, SS Chief Heinrich Himmler gave the order that the remaining ghettos in other Polish towns should also be completely emptied and dismantled. Poland had had the largest Jewish population of any European state, numbering about 3 million people, and most of this community would be dead by the time the Allies declared victory, along with about 3 million non-Jewish Poles. Further east, in those parts of the Baltic states and the Soviet Union occupied by the Nazis, Himmler's mobile killing units, known as Einsatzgruppen, had been given a free reign behind the advancing German troops, 
while communities were pitilessly massacred in mass shootings and the Jewish population had been decimated. But while the Nazis continued with their war of terror, the Allies were slowly closing in, and following discussions at the Trident Conference in Washington, preparations for the invasion of Italy had begun. With the Axis cleared from North Africa, Eisenhower now placed all his attention on taking Mussolini and his troops out of the war. US bombers intensified their attacks on the country, hitting ports, airfields and industrial areas. In Sicily, the towns of Palermo, Catania and Syracuse were targeted. The island of Sardinia, where there was already a sizable garrison of German troops, was also hit, and the ports of Messina and Naples on the mainland suffered intense bombardments. Allied aircraft based on Malta had begun bombing the port of Naples as early as 1940, and the city was no stranger to air raids. But as the tax escalated by the summer of 1943, life was becoming unbearable for its inhabitants. Explosions regularly tore through the city, and there were food and water shortages to contend with. In spite of reinforcements, German air power in Italy was dwindling under the hammering of Allied air power, and as the people of Naples endured a heavier bombardment than they had known before, the Nazis were unable to send the additional planes and anti-aircraft protection that Mussolini was urgently requesting. With fears growing that the Allies were paused for invasion, thousands of ordinary Italians began leaving their homes in the south of the country and convinced that it was only a matter of time before Allied commanders launched the attack, the Germans began moving additional troops into Italy from France. Meanwhile, the Allies had spent time deliberating the best course of action when planning their campaign and had finally decided that Sicily would give them the best foothold for an invasion of Italy. The tiny Italian island of Pantelleria, on the other hand, which lay astride the route to Sicily, not far from the Tunisian coast, would be a stepping stone to the larger island. With its sheer cliffs, Pantelleria had been used by the Axis powers as a base for aircraft and submarines, and from here, many attacks had been launched on British sea traffic in the Mediterranean. In the words of Winston Churchill, Pantelleria was a thorn in our side, and the island now posed a real threat to the planned invasion of Sicily. But keen to ensure that nothing jeopardized the lives of his men or the success of the Italian mission, Eisenhower had an unpleasant future in store for the little island. He and his commanders wanted to see whether, by softening up a target from the air, it could then be invaded using a minimal amount of men on the ground. Using Pantelleria as a testing ground to see the effect of saturation bombing on a defensive coastline, Allied aircraft began bombarding the island over five weeks from early May. More than 5,000 bombing sorties were flown, and 6,300 tons of bombs were dropped on Italian and German forces there. Barracks, supply dumps and aircraft were hit at the airfields, while British naval vessels hit the harbour area and damaged gun emplacements along the coastline. On June 10th, the offensive reached a crescendo, as wave after wave of bombers swept out from Tunisia, bombing the island day and night, pausing only for the Allies to invite the island to surrender. Meanwhile in Washington, Roosevelt urged the Italian people to overthrow Mussolini, but though many were keen to be rid of the fascist dictator, he would remain in power for a little longer yet. 
Back on Pantelleria, with no surrender offered, a British infantry division set off from the Tunisian coast on landing craft. At about 11 o'clock in the morning of June 11th, Allied airplanes spotted a white cross on the airfield just before the infantry arrived on the beach. It marked the first time in history that an enemy land force had been bombed into submission before troops could come ashore. The operation had in no uncertain terms brought home to an already nervous Italian population that the Allied armed forces meant business. As Eisenhower now focused on preparations for the invasion of Sicily, on the other side of the globe, battles in the Pacific theatre of war were gathering pace, and the Allies were beginning to dominate the seas. As an island nation, Japan depended on maritime links with the rest of the world, a fact that had been evident in the years leading up to the war. When the United States had imposed sanctions on Japan to prevent the country from importing raw materials, the tiny empire had had no choice but to fight for survival. By 1943, with new territory to administer and defend around the Pacific, the Japanese now had new concerns and it was vital that shipping lanes were kept open to transport troops and munitions to far-flung garrisons in the south. After the attack on Pearl, with many US carriers and destroyers taken out of action, Japan had made their spectacular entrance into the war from a position of strength and there was little opposition to their conquest of the islands around the Pacific. While their enemy was still in a state of shock, the Japanese did all that they could to maximize the advantage Pearl Harbor had given them. The crews of the Japanese submarines were expertly trained and they were equipped with what were called long lance torpedoes. These torpedoes had proved vastly more effective than those on the American submarines, which often turned out to be duds, either failing to explode on impact, detonating before reaching their target, or veering wildly off course. Military planners in the United States had been increasingly focused on the technology and tactics that would allow them to gain the upper hand against the Japanese in the Pacific theater of war. But the events at Pearl meant they needed to work even harder. At the beginning of the Pacific War, US submarine commanders had felt ill-prepared for the battles that lay ahead. Eventually, though, the US military decision-makers finally listened to their submarine commanders and in 1943 redesigned their torpedo, issuing a model with a stronger firing pin at its head. It was time for the rules of submarine warfare to change as the Americans took advantage of the element of surprise. Using shock tactics, the Americans launched surprise attacks on Japanese merchant shipping, and this strategy quickly became the order of the day. As this proved to be very effective, the US submarines became even bolder, attacking closer to the surface rather than from the depths of the ocean without a periscope in sight. This was only possible because, a year earlier, American codebreakers had succeeded in deciphering the Japanese naval codes and were now forwarding critical information to submarine captains with information on possible targets on the surface. Consequently, US submarines were equipped with radar to detect vessels in the vicinity, while patrolling planes were used to spot enemy submarines below the surface. The strike rate against Japanese vehicles rose dramatically through 1943 as the Americans targeted both military and merchant shipping, even fishing fleets. Slowly but surely, the Allies were gaining the upper hand in the stormy waters of the Pacific. And with General Douglas MacArthur at the helm as Supreme Commander of Allied Forces in the Southwest Pacific area, the Japanese were now facing a formidable enemy at sea 
in the air and on land. Taking control in the skies had continued to be a preoccupation in the South Pacific, where American and Australian forces were gradually making inroads along the southernmost perimeter of Japanese-held territory. At the beginning of June, the American Admiral William Halsey gave orders for the invasion of New Georgia, the largest island in the western province of the Solomon Islands chain that lay immediately north of Guadalcanal. The Americans were alarmed to learn that the Japanese had built an airfield at Munda, the largest settlement on New Georgia, and sporadic Japanese attempts to attack American positions on Guadalcanal soon became a problem. The Japanese feared that if the Allies managed to hold Guadalcanal undisturbed, it would be the starting point for an operation of gradual island hopping up to the northern Solomons. This would put the strategically crucial Japanese base at Rabaul on the island of New Britain under real threat from the Americans, and anything Japan could do to halt the US forces in their tracks was considered worthwhile. Even though the Japanese attacks on Guadalcanal were unlikely to shake the occupying troops from their positions, it was a hindrance, although the American advance towards Rabaul still gathered momentum. US Marines landed on the undefended southern tip of New Georgia and started an overland advance to the island's Viru Harbor. Without waiting to evict the Japanese garrison of more than 10,000 troops who were occupying the rest of the island, they began building an airfield where they'd landed. Within just a fortnight, Allied planes based at this new airfield were providing invaluable air support for the battle to take control of the whole of New Georgia. And as well as securing this island, when the Japanese airbase at Munda Point fell into Allied hands just a few weeks later, the American troops at Guadalcanal were left in peace. The Japanese attempts to bomb American positions on Guadalcanal from their base on New Georgia had been an indication of the kind of problem that the Allies could expect if Japan was allowed time to consolidate the perimeter defenses of its newly conquered empire. The Japanese culture of no surrender meant that every square mile of territory in the Pacific, whether on land or at sea, would have to be fought for to the death if necessary. The Allies had an unimaginably difficult task ahead of them, and the cost in terms of human sacrifice was destined to be immense, but the tide was without doubt now running in their favour as they launched a determined drive to push forward into the Central Pacific. And it wasn't only in the Pacific that the Allies were realizing that winning the war and ridding the world of Adolf Hitler and the Axis powers was going to be a costly business. The war was also taking its toll on civilian populations everywhere, because in the Soviet Union and throughout Europe, the death tolls reached horrific proportions. Britain continued to be subject to sporadic raids by the Luftwaffe, and in cities under the authoritarian rule of Hitler's war machine, people were living in constant fear. Stories of the atrocities were terrifying, but there was also a hardening of resolve, uniting those facing such appalling conditions as the Allies stood firm in their resolve to overcome fascism to create a world free of tyranny for generations to come. Nevertheless, for the time being at least, the most immediate preoccupation for the Allied leaders was the invasion of Sicily. There were many questions still to be answered, especially concerning what was likely to happen on a political level once the Allies reached the Italian mainland. Resistance to Adolf Hitler's plans for a thousand-year Reich was now anything but futile and even those who had been so far collaborating with the German Führer were about to reconsider their position, meaning that the fight for control of Italy was about to get very interesting indeed. Thank you.